We've seen that you can use all these different types of, of rhetoric to, uh, to slant. There we go. We use all these different types of rhetorical devices to uh, slant people's emotions, to take a word or a term and give it a, um, not necessarily a different meaning per se, but a different tone to it, a different sense to it. And um, we've seen a couple different devices that are a little bit more complex, like the loaded question. Right? Loaded question's actually got a certain structure to it, it's a dilemma. Hyperbole, um, hyperbole is, is more like the first type of thing, but the proof surrogate and rhetorical analogies and misleading comparisons, they actually have some structure to them. So now we're getting closer to talking about actual fallacies. And that's what we're going to be doing for the next two chapters. So what is hyperbole? That's a term that I think um, we don't use a lot in ordinary diction, but you guys are familiar with because you see it happening all the time. If somebody's saying things in a hyperbolic way, what are they, what are they doing? Exaggerating. They're exaggerating. Very good. What were you saying? This They're, building it up. They're building it up. Um, sarcasm is something a bit different. Sarcasm is, is usually intended to um, tear things down. If somebody gets angry, they may end up engaging in a lot of hyperbole when they're making more out of something than it is. And the way that your book talks about it is ex extravagant overstatement, right? Which is, that's actually a little bit of hyper hyperbole itself. It's a little hyperbolic because um, technically speaking, any sort of overstatement could be hyperbole. Um, now, like it says, a claim that exaggerates for effect is on its way to becoming hyperbolic depending on the strength of its language. And it uses this example of the term, a term that you still see being used a lot today, Fascist, right? This is a great example, and here's why. If you don't like somebody and you feel that they're being a little bit power hungry or authoritarian, it's a natural tendency to call them either a fascist or another word that people will often say, they're a Nazi, right? Now, that's hyperbole because technically speaking, um, who were the fascists? Who were, who were the Nazis? The actual ones. Adolf Hitler? Yeah, Adolf Hitler was, was uh, the leader of the National Socialist Party. That's what Nazi stands for. Um, fascists actually were a little bit before them. Uh, and there have been some, some other fascist regimes afterwards. But mostly they're around, you know, pre-World War II, in, between World War I and World War II. It was a particular political philosophy. There was a whole um, ideology to it. So not everybody who you don't like is a fascist. And people started throwing this term around from the time after the, the Nazis and the actual fascists fell. They started throwing this around as a way to um, attack people. If you didn't like somebody's, somebody's politics, especially if they were on the right, you called them a fascist. If they were controlling, if they were telling you what to do, even if they had the right to tell you what to do, they're a fascist. And so nowadays, there's a lot of people that have no idea what the term actually means. Um, and they use it fairly indiscriminately. You know, I, I've seen websites, for example, saying um, George W. Bush was a fascist. <laughs> Clearly not. I mean, if you actually know what the term means, that's got to be hyperbole. Uh, another book came out um, a few years ago called Liberal Fascism, making the argument that actually some of the, um, uh, the big names out there uh, in, in contemporary politics had more in, in, in line with fascist policies. But, you know, if you want to call Obama a fascist, that's really stretching things, isn't it? But really, to call anybody a Nazi unless they have a swastika somewhere, <laughs> you're, you're, you're stretching the truth. Likewise, on the other side, um, if you want to attack somebody on the left, what do you call them? What's the worst thing you could say? What's that? Racist. Well, actually, um, that would be anywhere, right? So let's put that one up, too. Calling somebody a racist. Now, there are a lot of people who are racist, right? And there's various forms of racism. But some people will use hyperbole and call people racists even when there's no evidence that they are. 
you know, really in order to call somebody a racist, you need evidence. Otherwise, you're just, as we say, playing the race card, right? And, and that doesn't do anybody any good. Um, I was thinking more like when you call somebody a communist. Um, Barack Obama was a communist because he's for uh, socialized medicine, or you know, as we call it here, universal health care. Well, you know, you don't have to be a communist to be for that because the Canadians have that. And as far as I can tell, the Canadians are not communists. There's a few up there. We actually have a communist party. Actually, there's three communist parties in the United States because they, they don't agree with each other. One is Stalinist, one is, or wait, one, one is Leninist, one is Trotskyite, and I think the other one is Maoist because uh, different countries disagree. Um, another term that you, you see people use Fundamentalist, right? Fundamentalist Muslims, fundamentalist Christians. Even they talk about fundamentalist Hindus. And there is actually a technical use of the term. Um, it was kind of interesting. There was a big, big flap over NPR. I don't know if any of you guys caught that. Uh, the CEO of NPR actually resigned over an incident that happened a few weeks ago where an NPR um, executive was caught on tape, caught on video, saying some really derogatory things that showed that, that at least he, and then the argument is that NPR as a culture is, is biased, biased against um, people on the, on the right. And one of the things that I noticed, because I used to teach religious studies, is he called evangelical Christians fundamentalists. Now, if you know anything about the history of, of Christianity, you know that those are two different groups. As a matter of fact, actual, real, fundamentalist churches split from evangelical churches over uh, some, some issues, and they will tell you um, evangelicals are not fundamentalists. Fundamental, in order to be a fundamentalist, you have to hold that there are certain fundamentals that are so essential to Christian um, you know, identity or fellowship that you can't compromise on those, and anybody who doesn't agree with those, you have to back, up, back away from them. So most Christians are not actually fundamentalists in any strong sense of the term. They may be something else that's often equated with that. They may believe in you know, the Bible being literally true. But that's not enough to make somebody a fundamentalist any more than um, liking power is enough to make one a fascist or being for universal health care is enough to make one a communist. These are all ways to use language very inaccurately, but very persuasively. Because what happens when you call somebody one of these things? Especially if you call them a racist. They get offended. They, they get ticked off, what were you going to say? They get offended. They get offended. But what, so you're, you're looking more at the interaction between you and the, the person you're talking to. What about the audience? What is the audience, how do they look at that person if you call them a, a racist? Negatively. Very. Yeah, or if you call them a fundamentalist, or if you call them a communist or a fascist. So these are ways to use language in hyperbolic ways. <sighs> ways to use ways, I shouldn't say that. These are ways of using language hyperbolically that, that can tear people down. Um, now you can do it positively too. You know, the book has this great example. Um, it says, not all color, strong or colorful language is hyperbolic. Oscar Peterson is an unbelievably inventive pianist. Um, now, if that's actually true, it's not hyperbolic. But are most musicians um, unbelievably inventive? No. no. As a matter of fact, this is, this is something that you ought to think about. Um, in the publishing industry and in the music industry, also in... in uh, television and movies, there are people who are paid precisely to, to write things that will make products seem, you know, very exciting, better, better than they are, higher quality. Um, some of you may consider that as a job option, you know, it's writing copy. And uh, they have to do this even for mundane things like, um, uh, what's, what's that network where they sell uh, things on TV QVC. all the time. QVC, yeah, yeah. Um, those people that are hired there, they have to constantly talk and use hyperbolic language. This is the best product 
This is going to revolutionize your life. Your whole life will be organized if you buy our filing cabinets. Have you ever watched that then? Uh, years and years and years ago. Um, ridiculous. Yeah, it didn't take me long to figure out that it wasn't something I wanted to spend much time watching. And hurry up, you have 30 seconds. <laughs> well, that's, that, that, why are they doing that? To why? get you to <coughs> not change your mind that you really don't need it? Exactly. They're, they're trying to get you to narrow the window of decision making. They're trying to short, short circuit critical thinking. Um, we're going to talk about um, some fallacies that are like that later on. So hyperbolic language um, is, is uh, uh, one way to, to slant things. And like they say, a claim can be hyperbolic without containing excessively emotive words. These are all pretty emotional, emotionally charged words, aren't they? But if you say, um, uh, parents who are strict, well here, he's got the example of fascists here. Um, Where, where am I looking? Um, oh, the Oscar Peterson. If you were going to say Oscar Peterson is the best pianist in the world, now if that's true, it's not hyperbole, right? Um, but how many can be the best at any given time? One. That's, yeah, that's, that's what constitutes being the best. So, unless you actually have some evidence for him being the best, and best is not a particularly emotive term, is it? Neither is worst. Absolutely worst would be, I suppose, more emotive, wouldn't it? Would it have a stronger connotation. If you don't have reason for saying something is really great or really bad, then you're engaging in hyperbole, whether there's a lot of you know, emotional baggage thrown in or not. Now, your book makes a really interesting point here. Hyperbole is an obvious slanting device. You can tell when somebody's using it, right? If you know the facts, if you know that Barack Obama is not, in fact, a communist, or, I mean, think about some of the other things they, they say about the guy. Um, some of the conspiracy theory stuff. He's a Muslim plant here to, there are, there are people actually saying he's a, a Muslim plant here to weaken the United States against radical Islam. Okay, well, that's fairly unbelievable. You want to see some evidence. It could be true, right? But you have to show us evidence that it's actually true. Um, now, hyperbole is pretty obvious when it, when it happens. Does that mean that because you see it happening and you label it, you've taken care of it? Like it says here, it has some sort of unconscious effects as well. Some subtle effects. Even if you reject the exaggeration, you may be moved in the direction of the basic claim. So you might reject the claim that this guy Oscar Peterson is the most invented musician, but now, because somebody's saying that, you, you start to think, well, he must be a pretty good musician. And they, that may not be the case at all. See, when somebody, let's think about it like, like, uh, like this. Let's say there's a continuum, and over here is the worst, over here is the best, and, you know, the, the exact middle is somewhere around here, um, the, you know, completely neutral place. So now, any given person in any given thing, your tendency is to place them here, right? Until you know something about them. Um, now, let's say you get into an argument with somebody about this, this musician. Pick any musician that you like. And they say, they are the absolute best. No musician has ever produced things as good as they are. You can think about, um, uh, you know, 13, 14, 15-year-olds. Right? They often make claims like that, don't they? This band is, is perfect. They get me. They speak to me. Right? Uh, nobody has ever produced music like this before. And then you find out that they, you know, a lot of their music is sampled and, you know, old repeats and things. Now... You started out here, right? With your assumption? Because you were being a critical thinker. They dragged you all the way to here. What's the natural human tendency? Sort of meet in the yeah. middle somewhere. And you may find yourself, if people are using hyperbolic language, thinking, well, they're not that great, but they are pretty good. But you may not have any evidence for that. 
Likewise, when people are using hyperbolic language, now think about our culture. Think about our, our, especially our political culture, where people are tearing each other down all the time. And they're claiming that the other side is completely destroying America, or the middle class, or pick whatever you want. Well, again, you started out here, right? Or at least you should have, unless you had, unless you had some bias, uh, because you want to see evidence. They dragged you here. The tendency is to meet again here. If this happens often enough, then what happens? This is now your this is now your sort of starting point, isn't it? They're going to keep using more hyperbolic language. Next time, you're meeting a little bit closer. Before long, you're buying into a highly ideologically charged position, one way or the other, or the absolute best or the absolute worst. Um, and this is how people acquire biases. Um, hyperbolic language plays a, a significant part in that. There's actually a comedian. I don't remember who it was, but they were talking about relationships, and the uh, line sort of like this. They were saying, in every relationship, there's one person who is the same person, and then there's the other person who's kind of the crazy person. And it, you know, varies how crazy they are. And you know, if you think about it, That's true. yeah, there, there are a lot of relationships where one person kind of compensates for the other, and they, they smooth things out. Could be that they have an anger problem, or maybe they do something embarrassing that they shouldn't do, and the other person has to kind of smooth things over. And so you know what the comedian's advice was? What? Be that person. Because, otherwise, you're stuck being the person who's smoothing things over. And so since, you know, um, there's got to be one crazy person and one sane person in the relationship, and being the sane person is a lot of work, why not be the crazy person? And so this, this uh, he was a guy, I don't remember his name. He uh, suggested, you know, your girlfriend says, um, I really don't like so-and-so. And then so you should say, oh yeah, she's terrible. I think we should go burn her house down. <laughs> and then, she, then, then, of course, the girlfriend will say, oh, no, 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 honey, no, 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 we're not going to do that sort of thing. And now you get off the hook, right? You don't have to smooth things over. What would that be? That would be being the hyperbolic one, right? And if you think about it, are there people in our culture who do that sort of thing? Who, who make other people take the responsibility for smoothing things out, for explaining them? Yeah. A lot of our... A lot of our political commentators on left and right do that. A lot of our celebrities say crazy things, and then they have to have people, uh, you know, fixing things for them afterwards. Like Charlie Sheen, you know, I don't think that that can be fixed. <laughs> <laughs> Although, actually, he did do an interesting bit of damage control. He put out a video that is um, a spoof of himself. Um, I think he's, he's being interviewed again or something. I, I can't remember. But he actually, all the things that he, the crazy things that he said in that, that first interview. What did he say? Um, what's that? What did he say? Yeah, saying on the news. He's just out of his mind. Can we say William and stuff? Say again? Can we talk about William Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, he's not bi bipolar, he's by winning. Yeah. But he said a lot of other things, too. Like he has Adonis DNA and, yeah. and tiger blood. And, and yeah. But anyway, in, in, in this. Uh, this spoof, he makes fun of himself. Um, I think in it he was like selling tiger blood or something along those lines. Um, let's go now to proof surrogates. So what's a surrogate? We use that term really only in one context that I can think of. The surrogate mother. Surrogate mother, right. And so what is, what is a surrogate mother? It's a, it's a substitute. So when we talk about a proof Okay, when you think about proof, you're thinking about reason to accept something. And if you're talking about proof, do we just mean, you know, kind of about, well, it could be that way, or, you know, maybe not. When we talk about proof, we mean something pretty strong, don't we? If you have proof of something, then you can actually rely on it. So, if we have... Proof is some sort of reason to accept some sort of, let's say instead of saying something, let's say some claim. <coughs> Surrogate is some sort of substitute. Like
studies show. But they don't tell you what the studies are. What are they doing? It, in a way, here's something I'd like you to think about. This is a surrogate for goods and services. Originally, paper money was actually backed up by, by what? By other forms of currency, like gold or silver. Nowadays, it, it's not actually the case. Um, and there was a big you know, to-do when they first switched away from the, the gold standard and they allowed currencies to float. But what gives this any value? The promise. Yeah, the fact that you can go into Quick Stop and exchange it for, I mean, you can't exchange it for much because it's a $1 bill, pack of gum, right? Or one-third of a gallon of gas. Or candy bar. Candy bar, there you go. Yeah, not a king-size candy bar these days, <laughs> right? Um, this is a surrogate, though. And it, it, if, if you find yourself unable to exchange this for goods and services, very quickly this will lose any value that it has. Um, I mean, it's actually made of nice paper, so you can still, you know, I suppose, sop up uh, spills or things <laughs> like that with it, right? Um, Think about countries where the, where the currency doesn't, doesn't matter, doesn't mean anything, doesn't have any value. What happened there? Well, there were too many cases where the money was just being used as a surrogate and didn't have anything backing it up. Didn't have any proof, you might say. Now, I can make up an imaginary study to fit any sort of thing that you want. Because, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. So I, and, and I'm pretty quick on my, on my feet. Um, and I'm not a con man. I'm not a advertising person. So imagine what somebody who would like to manipulate you could do to prove surrogates in conversations. If you're in the habit of saying, oh yeah, well, study, study says, so I'm going to accept it. If you're in the habit of accepting proof surrogates, you're going to be misled about a lot of things, especially when people choose to manipulate. Because you can say that, that, that studies show anything you want. As a matter of fact, quite often, this goes to the, the journalism thing that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Reporters often get stories wrong. They will say, a study shows that um, bipolar disorder is totally based in, in brain chemistry. And then you may actually go and look at the study. If, if it's a good newspaper article, especially on the web, it'll have links back to the original uh, stuff. And you go and you check it out and you find out that's not what the study said at all. Or they'll say a study has proven that X, Y, Z. And then you go and you find out there were only 60 people in the study. But it's about a population of, of millions. Right? Um, or even, even better than that, not, not a study. Um, in a recent book, a claimed author, so-and-so, has proven that men and women think about things in fundamentally different ways. Well, you know, you might want to actually take a look at that book and see whether that author has any good reasons for what they're saying. Uh, we, we are very eager to try to find, you know, meaning, information about things, especially things that we don't know that much about and we would like to know about. Uh, we don't want to be too accepting of that. Um, informed sources say that's another good one. Well, you know, you want to know who are those sources. And there may be cases where um, uh, reporters can't give their sources. Uh, for instance, if they're doing something about an undercover investigation. If, if they reveal that their source on a story about the mob is Jimmy so-and-so, then Jimmy so-and-so is probably going to get killed, isn't he? So you're not going to reveal all of your sources. But if it's something about, you know, something fairly mundane, they ought to be forthcoming with where their information is, is uh, derived. Um, studies show we saw... They give you this example of a proof surrogate in the Wall Street Journal. I remember this because my family is French-Canadian. and This is about the referendum that took place in Quebec, where Quebec, actually in the Canadian Federation, as opposed to the United States, where we you know, fought a war about this, 
Um, if a province decides it wants to leave the federation, it can by a majority vote of all the people in, in the province. And so Quebec, which was the French-speaking area of, of uh, Canada, they were, you know, kind of ticked off, and they, they thought, well, we're going to leave. And, and it was 49, uh, 4, and 51 percent chance. So they almost, they almost did leave Canada. And the Wall Street Journal says, we hope politicians on this side of the border are pay paying close attention to Canada's referendum on Quebec. Canadians turned out en masse to reject the referendum. There's every reason, there's the proof surrogate, there's every reason to believe that voters in the U.S. are just as fed up with the social engineering that lumps people together as groups rather than treating them as individuals. So what's the proof surrogate? There, there's every reason to believe. Well, what are the actual reasons to believe? Um, anybody can say that. Anybody can say, my side has all sorts of support, but until you actually see the support, you shouldn't agree with them. You shouldn't, you shouldn't just give them credit. Yeah. Would proof surrogates uh, work with like surveys? Like they say study show and stuff like that work. Yeah, let, let's say for example they say um, a recent survey but they don't give you any data. Who was surveyed, how many people were surveyed, what the uh, range of options were, you know. Um, they just say a recent survey shows that, uh, well think about advertising. Like the, go back to that toothpaste. The oh, the four out of five dentists uh, recommend yeah, Crest. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, I think that's a good that's a good example where something that fits one rhetorical device can also be a proof surrogate, in part because they're not providing any information about who are these these dentists who are surveyed, how many were surveyed. Now, if they like, let's say on their website, they're they're backing up that claim with, well, we actually surveyed. 5,000 dentists in San Antonio, Chicago, and Portland. Now there's no proof surrogate anymore. They, they're actually giving you the, the proof for it. They're not just giving you a, a promissory note, or an IOU, you might say. Um, so like it says, proof surrogates, they're not real proof or evidence. They don't mean that proof doesn't exist. It just means that it hasn't been supplied to you. And if you're a critical thinker, then you withhold assent until it's given to you. Uh, like it says, at best, proof surrogates suggest sloppy research. Or I would actually say sloppy um, modes of thinking and presenting data. Right? If, if, you're not, if, you're not, if you don't get in, used to the habit of actually giving people evidence to believe what it is that you're saying, that's kind of sloppy. And, and you can get away with that in a lot of contexts. But... Um, <clears throat> The higher you go up, the more competent people are, the more they're going to challenge you. The more they're going to say, where is your evidence? Why are you actually saying that? How, how can you back it up? So you want to get in the habit of not using proof surrogates. Um, like it says too, sometimes they can be just propaganda or um, ways of manipulating people. So, Rhetorical analogies and misleading comparisons. Um, what is an analogy? That's a term you guys know. What's going on in an analogy? <clears throat> I'll give you an example of one that you may have seen <clears throat> when you were taking the SAT. Well, you wouldn't have seen it on the SAT because it's too simple. But um, dog is to puppy as cat is to. Uh, there you go, kit, right? I was going to give you A, one thing, B, another thing. Yeah. Now, why is that an analogy? You're looking at the relationship. What's the relationship between dog and puppy? Dog is older and younger. Dog is an older version of the younger thing. Right, so cat, kitten, you look for the same relationship, and there's an analogy between them. So, now you can make good analogies. That's a good analogy, because they actually do have that, that thing in common. Um, when you're drawing analogies between things, you may sometimes stretch it a bit far. So, for example, uh, your book has this, this uh, example of something that's still a, a current issue. Um, Social Security, right? How many of you work? 
Only, only a few of you. Once you start working, you'll you'll start you know seeing this thing FICA on your uh, your statements, and that's a good chunk that they take out. Yeah. That's Social Security. All that money is going into sort of a general fund, and the money that you're putting in is actually then being funneled back out to pay for people who are receiving Social Security benefits. So you know older people who retired. Uh, people on disability, it also pays for uh, widows, widowers, you know, their children. Um, you know, for instance, when my dad died, uh, my mom received social security checks for my sister and I until we were 18. Right? So social security does a lot of good. There's been a lot of talk in the last 10 years about what are we going to do about social security and what, you know, why, is there, why is it still a live issue? Well. Um, people are living a lot longer than we expected them to, and when Social Security was set up, most people weren't living to 65. Um, nowadays, people can live to 80, 90, you know, and, and they need a lot of uh, care. Um, so that's one issue. Are there as many people putting into it? No, because when they created it, there was Again, it was sort of a disproportionate, um, uh, what would you call it, a curve <laughs> of, of workers. See, in any given population, before certain things take place in modern society, let's say this is the age of people, right? And here's the just number of people. You're going to have a lot of younger people, and then as time goes on, people die off. So there's not as many older people as there are, you know, middle-aged people as there are younger people. And who are the people that are actually working and contributing? They're, they're in this group, right? The younger people. Well, not, not children, of course, but... Now, what happened that's really skewing things, you guys have heard of the baby boomers, yeah. right? Okay, the baby boomers are now actually retiring, and they're the generation, uh, from, from most of you, they're your grandparents' generation. They're my, my parents' generation. Um, you guys are considered the millennial generation, I'm considered Generation X, right? So here's the problem. The, the baby boom came in. And it made this big peak, right? Now that's okay when they're contributing. Actually, your generation is bigger too, so there'd be kind of like a, a little a little hump, right? My generation is half the size of the baby boomer generation. So what happens with, when the wave goes on? Um, now you got this problem. You have all these people that have to be provided for, but you have less workers. Right? Why is that? Well, because that generation is larger, for one thing. Uh, like I said, the baby boom generation is about twice the size of my generation. So for every two of them, there's, there's only one of us contributing. Whereas it used to be, you know, switched around. And they're going to live for a long time. So they're going to collect Social Security benefits for a lot longer than, than they were expected to. Now, so you have Social Security, um, and what's the misleading comparison? Social Security is like a Ponzi scheme. Do you guys know what a Ponzi scheme is? Madoff is a guy who did one, but, but what is an actual Ponzi scheme? It was named after a guy named Ponzi, who was the first guy to come up with this, this scam. Um, some corporations that are rather shady uh, actually have been accused of being Ponzi schemes. Don't you want people to buy into what you're trying to say you're selling or yes. helping them with? And then you're like somebody who's at the top of the, the pyramid, as we call it, right? And what they do is they bring a couple other people into the scheme. And they are promised a certain reward for participating in the scheme. 
But where is the money for their reward going to come from? It's not coming from the investment that this person is making. They have to get some other people involved in the, the scheme, and then they get a cut of the scheme, right? And the guy at the top gets an even bigger cut, and each tier has to find more victims, essentially. And the people on the bottom are thinking, they're seeing these other people, and they're getting rich. And they're saying, wow, that's a great money-making opportunity. I've got to get in on that. And what they're doing is they're just feeding the money up the chain. Uh, ultimately, the money, what's going to happen is sooner or later, you're going to run out of people at the bottom, and then the whole thing is going to fall apart. And the people in this level are going to do OK, because they're going to get out while the getting is good, and they're going to take their millions with them. All of these people are going to be screwed. Direct sales are like the hottest in the industry. Yeah. Uh, any any sort of thing, any sort of scheme that expects you, in order to for you to get um, your portion of the cut, expects you to recruit other people, maybe a Ponzi scheme. So you should be suspicious of any anything like that. Now, is Social Security a Ponzi scheme? That's that's the question. Um, and, and it was compared to a Ponzi scheme. Why? Well, think about it. How does Social Security work? We, we are productive members of society. We pay um, money into it. And ultimately, we're supposed to get money out, just like the people in the Ponzi scheme are supposed to get money out. But it's not elective like a Ponzi scheme was it. Okay, that's that, the only actually, you know, I mean, that's the only that makes it sound even worse then, doesn't it? Because <laughs> you're forced. Yeah, that, that is a, now notice what, um, uh, what, what's going on. Some vital difference between these is being pointed out. Some, some characteristic that they don't share. You're right, Ponzi scheme is not elective. Um, the other thing is, Social Security, the money is actually going somewhere. It's not just going to somebody at the top of the pyramid. And the people in the, you know, with a, uh, a Ponzi scheme, the person at the top of the pyramid is the same person the whole time. With Social Security, it's more like, like this. You have generations. And each generation is paying for the previous generation's retirement. Um, so in a way, the people who retired earlier, and the baby boomers who are, who are going to exhaust, here's the problem. Congressional bu Budget Office estimates that the Social Security money will actually run out um, just about the time that I'm supposed to start collecting. <laughs> about right. 2035. Actually, I won't collect in 2035 because what do they do? They extend the age. Yeah. So I, I think I, right now I have to be something like... Uh, 68 and a half, or maybe 69 to collect. By the time that it's time to collect, maybe they'll boost it up to 75. How do you think that you well, that's if you want early, but you don't get all your your, your income with that. Um, now, is it a Ponzi scheme? Well, no, because each generation is is paying so that it will actually move up. With a Ponzi scheme, you don't move up. If you are at the, the fifth tier, you're at the fifth tier. And when the Ponzi scheme falls apart, you are going to be screwed. And somebody will actually have all the money. With Social Security, if Social Security goes bankrupt, it just, you know, it's going to break down because there won't be enough income being derived at these levels to, to pay for the next generation. Um, but what's happening here, each generation gets to move up. So you guys would be um, this generation right here. If they can fix Social Security, in another 20 years, you're going to be this generation. And then in another 20 years, you'll be this one. And then you'll hit pay dirt, right, when you get to collect. So if they can fix it, it, it won't be anything like a policy scheme. So that's a misleading comparison. When people make that comparison, why are they doing that? What, what goal do they have in mind? Well, they wanted to change the Social Security um, system so that you could do private investment. Right? They, they had some sort of agenda in mind. There's other uh, examples of, of um, rhetorical analogies. Um, your book has a good example. Hillary's eyes bulge just a little like a chihuahua's. 
Now, how does that sound? Horrible. Horrible, did you say? <laughs> yeah. Um, if you're comparing, first of all, if you're dealing with somebody's eyes bulging out, that's not good by itself, right? <laughs> and if you're comparing somebody to a chihuahua, that's, that's not the nicest comparison to make. Why would somebody do that? Well, there's some sort of rhetorical force there. Um, they also include comparisons. Um, Dave Barry's description of parenthood. Having kids is like having a bully alley installed in your brain. Um, you know, what would be the comparison there? Well, what's a bowling alley like? Loud. Yeah, not just loud. Cacophonous, constantly. It's, you know, that, that, that crash of the pins and the balls. You've all been in bowling alleys before, right? Um, so having kids is like having a bowling alley installed in your brain. What, what's the point that he's trying to, to make there? This is a humorous comparison, right? Is, is having kids really like having a, a, that, that sound constantly in your head? No. Um, so it, 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 you know, if you took it at its word, that would be a, a misleading comparison. Uh, a lot of humorous things would be. Okay? Your book gives you a few uh, questions that you should keep in mind when you're thinking about comparisons or about analogies. One is, is information missing? Um, talks about unemployment, one of the big issues currently, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, if they say that the unemployment rate has gone down, is that necessarily good news? Mm -hmm. Well, let's say, let's say it is. Let's say the unemployment rate actually does go down, because it does sometimes. Is that, is that necessarily good news? Mm -hmm. Why not? Because the economy still is pretty good. Well, yeah. What about the unemployment rate itself? What does it measure? By how many people file for claims? What about the people who don't file? Exactly. Are... Yeah. So if people have quit, there I forget exactly the designation. There's a designation for people that have just quit looking for work altogether. They've sort of opted out of the system. They're not being measured. So let's say five percent of the population. That would be pretty bad. Let's say five percent of the population is in that boat. If you have a five percent unemployment rate, but there's another five percent of the the, the uh, population that just isn't even looking for work, that's a really big problem. And that 5% unemployment rate that sounds really good is masking a deeper problem. So you want to know if there's, if there's uh, information that's missing. Is the same standard of comparison being used? You, you've often heard of comparing apples to oranges, you know that expression? What, what do we mean when we say that? There are two unlike things. Two unlike things, or, or unlike systems, or unlike uh, issues. Um, if we want to pick on uh, Charlie Sheen again, there's crazy, and then there's Charlie Sheen crazy, yeah. right? Um, or you could talk about um, celebrity. Somebody could be a somebody could be well known in, in the local area, like you know there are area celebrities, um, but that's not quite the same as having the notoriety that um, people who are on TMZ have, right? And there's a qualitative difference there. It's hard to make comparisons sometimes when you go from one level to the next. Um, and then if you're comparing numbers, you always want to know what are the actual units there. Are, are they using the same numbers? Uh, are the items comparable? Are they, are they in fact comparable? They have this great example in the book about baseball players who use steroids. Uh, why do they put an asterisk next to some of their statistics? To show that, you know, if, if um, let's think about somebody who was around before that there was, there was steroids. Um, and Babe Ruth, right? Yeah. Um, kind of an erratic hitter, but when he was hot, he was really hot. Now, he was a, you know, a big fat guy uh, and uh, um, could really knock him out of the park. But he didn't do as much as, say, Barry Bonds. But Barry Bonds has got these, you know, gorilla arms. Why? Because he uses steroids. Um, can you compare the record of one person to another in those circumstances? Probably not. Because the steroids give such an incredible advantage to the person who uses them. Even if you don't use steroids, can you, can you compare current baseball players to past ones? I mean, the, the current baseball players they work out all the time, they have very strict regimens. Is that what they were like in the 1950s? No, these guys would go out drinking at night and then come in and, you know, hungover, hit the ball, 
you know, pad around the field. Now it's a very different kind of, kind of game. Uh, is the comparison expressed as an average? This is another thing to be very careful about. Averages are just that. They don't actually represent any one individual figure unless that individual is perfectly average. So nobody actually has 2.3 kids, right? But that's the average children per household or at least it used to be. Um, when they're using averages, you want to be fairly careful in making assumptions based on those. Because any given population, you know, you guys know this from, from math class, right? Like the bell curve. The bell curve. Yeah, you guys all remember. Like when you're doing grading, you know, the C is in the middle, and most of the students get a C. And when they actually do a real curve in your, in your classes, very few students get an F, very few students get an A. You're all familiar with this. So what's the average? The average is a C. But does that mean that, that this person right here got a C? No. They could be anywhere on this, on this curve. Um, so you want to be careful when you're comparing averages to other averages. Especially when you're going from, okay, this average correlates to this average, so therefore this thing connects to this thing. Those things, you know, one of the things may be on this end of the average, the other thing may be on this end of the average. So you've got to be very careful about that. So I'll see all of you on uh, Monday. Have a good weekend. We're going to start with Chapter 6 uh, pretty soon.